Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us on for this event on uh, how can investors help fix the food system. We're going to be looking at the investment community's role and the role of data, transparency, standards and regulation in food systems transformation. Today is COP's first ever health day, and it's great that COP has a focus on health and food this year. We know that food systems are currently responsible for about 90 percent of global deforestation and 70 percent of biodiversity loss, a third of greenhouse uh, gas emissions globally, and that it uses about 70 percent of our global freshwater supplies. And that's having a negative impact on yields, food security, resilience, soil health and the nutrients in the food that we produce. Um, severe weather events are already affecting our ability to produce and transport food, and that's threatening our ability to provide healthy diets for everyone. The current food system is failing billions of people around the world. Up to 828 mi million people go hungry every day, and yet 2 billion people globally are living with food or obesity. Poor diets are one of the major drivers of mortality and morbidity. One in five deaths globally is associated with poor diet. We know that the food environment that we live in shapes how we eat. Healthier and more sustainable foods are often much more expensive and the less healthy, less sustainable foods are cheaper, more accessible, more affordable. Current data estimates that the uh, cost of poor diets globally is around $9 trillion when you take into account factors like obesity and overweight, non-communicable diseases, malnutrition. So we need a systems level approach to transforming the food system. But the changes that consumers can make are really small compared with the changes that governments, policymakers and the private sector can make. Investors are increasingly aware of the material financial risks of failing to make healthier and, and uh, more sustainable diets affordable and accessible for everybody. And given these risks, food systems really do need to be more integrated into ESG considerations because it creates the opportunity to join up the dots between climate, food security, nutrition and health. Um, we know that investors haven't traditionally been part of the multi-stakeholder dialogue around food systems transformation, and yet they have significant potential to help transform the systems. So now that we've seen the scale of the challenge, how can the investment community help change the food system? So to help us answer some of these questions, I'd like to welcome our panelists, Nicola Day, who's Deputy Head of Green Bank, Laurent Compare, who is Managing Director and Head of Stewardship and Engagement at Boston Common Asset Management, and John Willis, who's the Director of Research at Planet Tracker. Thank you all for being here today. Um, Lauren, I'd like to direct the first question at you, if that's okay. Um, why is it that institutional investors such as Boston Common Asset Management are interested in food systems transformation? Absolutely. So, oh, absolutely. Is it working? Absolutely. Um, so as uh, our firm is actually leaning in towards investing in public equities, including food and beverage companies, retailers, um, uh, some some uh, restaurants, and we have uh, three core engagement and investment pillars. Uh, one is focused on climate, uh, uh, climate change and earth renewal, the other one on inclusion, and the third one on health and well-being. So really health and well-being, including proper nutrition is sort of one of our core investment themes. I had stewardship and engagement and have long looked at the um, health inequities and, and also sort of the irresponsible <laughs> manufacturing and production of, um, you know, packaged foods. And so as an investor, I um, became intrigued with the opportunity to engage the food and beverage uh, uh, companies globally on nutrition performance um, uh, through the access to nutrition index, which actually globally benchmark um, about 20, uh, over 20 food and beverage companies, the likes of Unilever, um, all the way to Mars and Mondelez. Um, and uh, I uh, was an expert um, on their on their methodology, their initial methodology, and then actually joined the board. And so I even saw the evolution and the growing interest investors had on looking at health and well-being and nutrition performance, moving from just looking at the way companies, the company policies, actually assessing um, the, the food portfolios and integrating that um, over the years. Now, we focus both on sort of like the global companies as well as local benchmarks in India and, uh, and the U.S. 
and looking at you know the the diversity of, of uh, issues. Maybe I'll just say one thing about the kinds of metrics we looked at under the Access to Nutrition Index. This was looking at um, um, the, the overall um, nutrition profiling of the food portfolio, um, their definition of healthy, R&D into reformulization, but also most importantly, looking at alignment across the value chain on things like accessibility and affordability, labeling, marketing, especially marketing to children, and then finally lobbying, where the companies themselves lobbying um, to support um, the ecosystem in terms of proper nutrition um, and, and, and health and well-being in the markets, the global markets they were, uh, they were manufacturing. Sorry. Thank you. That's great. I think the alignment point is actually really important. I'm sure we're going to come back to that. Um, Nicola, the next one's for you. Um, can you tell us a bit about the main financial risks that the global food system is facing if things continue as business as usual? And how are you managing those risks? Yes. I mean, in terms of what uh, we're looking to undertake in the sustainable investment management world is that we're valuing companies now in terms of all the risks and the opportunities and the growth factors that they have for the future. So as well as all the sort of quantitative times type of um, areas so like the sort of financial metrics that we would value a company on, as well as the, the, the business um, model viability and the quality of um, management, all the other sort of qualitative type of factors are really important because they create sort of risks for that value of the, the company going forward. So in terms of the, the food systems in particular, you know, the, the areas where we do have risks are really across the value chain for a food company. Um, so it starts in supply chains. Obviously, there's lots of direct risks now for companies within that from um, areas of environmental degradation and deforestation, biodiversity loss. That really affects um, the ability of, of companies, uh, their capacities um, in terms of, of crop yields. Um, so that's a very sort of direct risk that actually has to be factored into um, models. We then have the sort of broader systemic risk in terms of the food system, looking at the healthiness of food, uh, chronic um, and, and obesity um, areas. Um, you know, those all very much feed into um, trillions of, of economic losses, which really affect on that sort of systemic basis. And I think the other really important part is the transitional uh, risks. Now, we really are now looking at a great sort of transformation in companies now as they start to transition to a more sustainable future. Obviously, within the food industry, there's a lot there to do. Um, so really sort of picking up on what will be the policy levers going forward in, in this area. There need to be many of them. And um, those will impact the actual valuations of the stocks. They'll also impact, you know, how the company operates uh, for a company to be able to have sort of vision of where they should be taking their business models. They need a level playing um, on the policy side. So again, you know, really having that certainty of where policy is going is, is very important. Thank you. I think that's also a really important point around the, the policy and having that um, level playing field and, and the policy um, direction that's very clearly set. Um, John, um, what would you say the main trends and barriers that um, you're seeing in Planet Tracker in terms of transitioning to a healthy and sustainable global food system and what of, which of those should investors be trying to bear in mind when they're looking at investing in food and drink companies? Yeah, uh, thank you, Sarah. So I, I think I should just say, um, for those of you who don't know, uh, uh, Planet Tracker is a not-for-profit and we are very much focused on the financial market. So a lot of the discussions we have are off the record, so I won't be revealing any names of financial institutions. And I think we should recall that a lot of financial institutions are not as advanced on food systems as my colleagues on the panel. So please bear that in mind. I, I think um, I'm going to start with the negatives mm -hmm. and then end with the positive, because I always think that's a bit better. Um, I think one of the struggles with the uh, financial system is that 
food doesn't fit into an easy category. So a lot of the financial system is in various sectors, whether you're in corporate finance, whether you're in lending, whether you're in research. And uh, we actually looked at 400,000 companies in the food system, so a very big database. And we could identify nine nodes. So you can imagine that is actually quite difficult for a lot of banks uh, investment banks, asset managers to put together. So that's everything from inputters. So think of fertilizers, pesticides. You then go to the sort of producers, if you like, that can be livestock, that can be arable. Then you're sort of going through to the uh, manufacturers, the food presses, that can be in beverage, that can be in food. Then you go to wholesalers, then you go to retailers, then you go to food service, and then you end up with waste, unfortunately, at the end. So actually, someone looking at food should be looking at the whole thing. And, and that's the core food system. Um, I'll be very honest with you. One of the criticisms we had when we did this whole analysis of the global food system is people said, well, you didn't include plastic packaging. No, no, you're right. But it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. So we went for that course. So I think there's a practical issue about um, companies, investment companies, having to put that whole thing together to actually understand the whole food system. So I think that's pretty challenging. The second thing that we come across time and time again is this is a very emotional issue for a lot of people. So, and I'm not saying that that isn't right. So two main things I'll point to is one, there's a sort of global north, global south view. And we have got to be so cautious about saying, Global, I, I don't actually like the term global north, but we'll use it, but is developed countries telling the developing countries how to feed themselves. It's very, very sensitive indeed. I think a lot of financial institutions are, are aware of that. But maybe more personally, um, I've been in a, a number of meetings where you start to talk to individuals about what they should be eating. They do not. This is personal choice as they view it. And I've seen people leave the room. I'm not saying they're wrong to do that. I'm just saying it's a very, very emotional uh, topic as well. And then I think to put it right is very, very demanding. You've got to think of a whole load of actions. We actually identify six actions that people can look at. But, but essentially, it's a lot. So what's the positive in all of this? From the financial institution, uh, so from the capital markets view, we actually value that core uh, food system as worth about 14 trillion, okay, of which about nine trillion dollars is in private uh, private hands. So there's a lot of money in it, which means there's going to be a lot of focus, and I think we're seeing that. Yeah, I Thank think you. that's that's true, and it's really good to see that food has obviously risen up the international agenda, particularly at this COP. So that's that's yeah, really important. Um, in terms of the sort of the main challenges or barriers that the investment community is facing in aligning their investments with healthy and sustainable food systems transformation, um, to what extent is the lack of transparency in the food and drink sector an obstacle to investment in healthier and more sustainable foods? Yes, I mean, I think certainly the, the, the data and transparency on that side is a big blocker in terms of how we actually value things. I mean, the, in the sustainability investment market as a whole, you know, a lot of the sustainability metrics are just being set up. You know, we have some quite good metrics now from the climate change side in terms of scope one, two and three um, and the, the TCFD um, disclosures. Um, so those are very useful from the sort of climate risk side. But obviously, food systems and policy that need a much wider type of metric, really, to um, be able to pinpoint the, the risks and opportunities within um, business models. So data is definitely the, the, the biggest challenge. Um, it's also the sort of type of data, you know, certainly to date, it's been very much on a, a voluntary basis. And again, you know, that is, is no good. We need it on a mandatory basis. And that's certainly um, what we're pushing for um, in green banks have been collaboration um, with others is to have that mandatory side. But we do find, you know, with companies, the, the there's so many more um, investors now looking for the sustainability 
angles on um, valuing companies, it, you're recognizing that it is really important. They have material financial risk sustainability um, areas. Um, and we do hear from companies you know, that they asked in so many different ways how to quantify it themselves. They're writing reports for various people. So trying to get that sort of transparency, but also really trying to get um, the, the area so it is sort of very um, adaptable and standardized. Um, is is one of the most important um, things. So you can, you know, rank companies just as you would on financial um, metrics. That's the sort of area that we need to get to, something that's very interpretable for, for all. Thank you. Yeah, and I think what uh, what we're seeing at the Food Foundation is that through our Plating Up Progress dashboard, where we benchmark um, companies operate, food and drink companies operating in the UK, is that um, the sustainability metrics, as you mentioned, there are lots of frameworks out there, but there isn't really anything on the health side. So we're, you know, we're definitely pushing for more disclosure, transparency, reporting on um, on the health metrics from food and drink companies as well. Um, so, John, in terms of um, <laughs> regulatory landscapes, um, they seem to be evolving with initiatives like the ISSB, the CSRD, CS Triple D, et cetera. Um, what's your view on these sort of global regulatory moves towards corporate reporting on an international level? And will they make a, a tangible impact, do you think? I think it, well, I have to answer it, it depends. So <laughs> if we just go through, because uh, it's shocking the acronyms, isn't it? Yes. It just never stops. <laughs> it's, it just, uh, um, so if we take the ISSB that, that you mentioned, the Inter International Sustainability Standards Board, we view at Planet Tracker, they're the crucial one. And I'll explain why. So they are moving. And actually, if I may say, for an accounting body, they're actually moving quite quickly. I mean, remember that accountants have to go very carefully. They have to sort of get consensus. And it, it's a really tricky job. Now, they have already uh, issued sort of uh, some standards S1 and S2, and they've gone out for consultation and said sort of, what do you think we should be looking at next? And in that next was social, which is going to incorporate health. I completely agree with you on that. Mm -hmm. And nature, mm -hmm. um, but, or should they continue down the line that they're already doing? Uh, which is basically sustainable risks, short, medium and long term and climate related disclosures. They're going to reveal that roadmap that they're going to follow. The best I'm getting at the moment is the first half of next year, mm -hmm. which I think is entirely reasonable, by the way, through the guy. Why do we think they're crucial? Because when accounting bodies come out with rules, if you're a CFO, you listen, because when you sign off, if you're breaking those rules, that's a really serious infringement. Mm -hmm. I'm not suggesting CFOs do, just as we get, but I think mm -hmm. that's really, really important. So we're enormous believers in, in accounting rules. The CSRD, which is the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, and the CSDDD, uh, which is the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, are sort of interlinked. One is saying, this is what you need to sort of reveal. It's the transparency. And this is you sort of will reveal it, if, if you know what I mean. Very, very helpful. I, I'm not denying that. But accounting standards are most important. Mandatory, very important. And actually, a lot of the food companies want it to be mandatory because of the level playing field. In other words, you don't get a competitive advantage over someone else because you're, you're being the good person in the room. I think the other thing, on the negative side is if you do break the rules they've got to be meaningful mm -hmm. in other words don't fine them a few thousand it's worth taking the risk to do that make them sort of meaningful penalties and finally because i've got two investors on the panel i've got to say i do think investors can demand more and more disclosure which obviously we're hearing from the panelists that, that they are that is a very important push mm -hmm. And the fact that these um, initiatives are still mostly in the voluntary space, um, do, you, do you see them moving into a more mandatory role in further down the line or do you think they'll remain? 
Can I just say I hope so? Yeah. I really I think they've got we've seen too many times voluntary not working. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, maybe for another panel another day, there's a lot of lobbying mm. that goes on. Um, but mandatory absolutely would be the preference. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah, that's that's the point that um Lauren was making about corporate lobbying and, and sort of the food and drink sector. And I think um we we might be seeing some of that playing out in the the down, the watering down of some of the aspirations of making things mandatory. So, yeah, definitely challenging. Um, moving on slightly in terms of topic, um, looking at the role of investors in this, Nicola, would you say it's fair to say that there hasn't been much consideration by governments so far that the investment community might be a key stakeholder in in food systems transformation and policy development? Um, and why should governments, you know, ensure that the investment community's voice is being included in those discussions? And and why should investors consider getting involved in that? Um, and it would be really good if you could tell us a bit about the uh, Investor Coalition on Food Policy that Green Banks is um, on the advisory board for. Yes, indeed. Yeah. That's a very long question. Yes, yeah, no, exactly. I think, you know, the investor community has been um, left out in terms of a lot of the policy um, side. I think we often see this where things do happen in in silos um and recognizing you know the important part that the investment community does have in actually valuing these um companies and you know we we we're, we're the ones really that are looking for that long term value from from companies and so in terms of the advice we can offer we can offer that advice in terms of you know how policies can be set up um, so they can provide that sort of long term certainty for, for companies' business models. Um, so as Sarah said, that we have set up um, the Investor Coalition on, on Food Policy. We did this actually um, after our, um, the UK, the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, DEFRA, um, had commissioned a national food um, strategy in 2019. And that resulted in a, a report coming out in um, 2021. I mean, it's quite astounding, actually, that we that was the first independent review that uh, we we had had of the UK's food system in 75 years. So it shows how, you know, it really has been left behind as a sort of integrated topic, topic and an, an important um, part to look at. So what we did find from that report, um, you know, really recognising that the investor didn't have a, a seat at the table um, when it comes to advocating for these well-designed uh, regulations of how to build a sort of healthy, sustainable and affordable um, food system. Um, but also one of the big takeaways from that um, was that we do need a more robust reporting um, framework for companies. And the report did actually recommend the mandatory uh, reporting requirements. Um, so that's really where we got um, involved with that. Um, so obviously in, in collaboration um, with, with others, obviously we're on the advisory group that, with um, Green Bank, but in collaboration with uh, the, the Food Foundation as well, um, setting up this um, coalition, uh, which has about some six trillion um, under um, under sort of un, under the funds um uh, uh, pledged from the the members um so it you know it can be very powerful we're, we're definitely looking to sort of expand the me membership to make it more powerful and i think hopefully could be a blueprint um for others on a on a global basis thank you and um, yeah just to sort of give you um a bit of insight so the the investor coalition on food policy has been actively engaging with the uk government on um sort of health and sustainability metrics, particularly on the health ones, um, and is um, engaged in sort of a, a working group that uh, the UK government has set up on this. I won't give you too much more detail because it's very specific to the UK, but and there's lots of acronyms. So it's, yeah, quite, we've had enough of acronyms, I think, at the moment. Um, so like coming to Lauren, actually, in terms of um, what investors need and what role governments and policymakers can play in removing barriers and incentivizing a, a stronger flow of private capital into healthy and sustainable food systems, um, do you have any 
とそんな。I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to continue on the、uh, transparency theme. But first of all, we need sort of a global standard for what healthy is defined as. So, really, sort of having a,、um, a, a clear definition of、um, the de definition of healthy because the US FDA has a different one, the UK has a different one, Australia has a different one.、Mm -hmm. um, so, one, and, and specific on nutrition, right? Two, Um, uh, some mm, incentives, but also enforcement,、uh, enforcement on marketing claims. And, and then this idea of, of mandatory disclosure on,、um, or, or at least investors、um, being able to ask for transparency on lobbying、um, and lobbying alignment and understanding policy positions by the FB companies themselves and, and everyone across the ecosystem of food. Um, of whether or not you are um, supporting um, that environment for proactive investment in healthier options or are actually、um, detracting and, and being a barrier towards、um, uh, the passing of,、uh, of good legislation which supports health,、uh, healthy ecosystem and, and health and nutrition. Mm -hmm. Especially marketing to children. I think one area that we constantly are fighting the, the food and safety companies on are、um, their definition of children, right? Marketing to children under the age of 12, 12 and under. And that, that critical, you know, that needs to be focused on is teenagers, right?、Mm -hmm. And again, this idea of sort of like marketing,、um, marketing to teenagers and online marketing and the different forms of marketing that happen. We need a little bit more control on the ecosystem. And with AI and algorithms, it's only going to help.、Yeah. That's actually a really interesting point about the AI.、Um, yes,、it、probably needs a lot more. Auto bots selling you know, the, <laughs>、yeah. the, you know, the chocolate、uh, bars online and the、mm. sugary drinks. Yes, I think in, you know, in the UK, we're seeing that like, I think it's something like 1% of marketing spend is, is allocated to you know, healthier foods like fruit and veg and, and things like that. And a lot more is obviously dedicated to foods that are high in salt, sugar, fats, and so on. So, yes, a really important point there. Yeah.、Um, so, John, what would,、uh, what would Planet Tracker recommend that the investment community and, and policymakers prioritize in terms of taking action? Like, you know, we've, we've got sort of commitments and we do have laws in place, but they don't necessarily get actually translated into action. What would you recommend that, that governments and, and investors、um, sort of prioritize?、Um, well, we very arrogantly wrote a note,、um, uh, basically a, a, a financial markets roadmap for a global food system, which is on an open access basis on our, our website. So please do go and have a look at it if it's of interest. Um, I, I think what's crucial is two things mean we can't really avoid this for very long. I mean, looking at this topic. So, one is we know this food is, is, is related to our existence, and in that is a health component as well. So, if we want to exist, we've got to get food right.、Uh, and the second thing, is, as far as the capital markets are concerned, They really don't need a lot of convincing that it's very important in terms of allocation of capital.、Uh, that's where we are at the moment, let alone new allocation of capital. And the financial markets are very, very good at spotting innovators. We've seen that on obesity, drugs, and things. I mean, maybe it's a, a dark side of, of health, but financial markets, if they see an opportunity, they'll go for it. So,、uh, what, we, what we did,、uh, and we actually Did this with a lot of partners, including the FAO. We, we tried to say, you come out with a long list of things and people are overwhelmed. But what we, what we recommended were essentially you need traceability systems, but you sort of need that in loads of areas. So it's not particularly special to food. I mean, you need it in pollution, plastic. So traceability、uh, systems are, are crucial. We've got to do something about、uh, loss and waste.、Um, we, we really have. And unfortunately, a lot of that is at the consumer end,、mm -hmm. actually, which is in the global north, which is a bit uncomfortable,、uh, to be honest. 
deforestation. I mean, that is the classic link between nature and climate. I know they're often viewed as separate, but that's just a brilliant example of where it, it comes together. Uh, methane, again, agri-methane, really important. I mean, let's remember agri-methane is a bigger um, issue than it is on energy in methane. I mean, that's how important it is. Uh, and then there's the regenerative side. And, and the thing that we're encouraging there is there is increasing focus on regenerative agriculture, but also look at aquaculture. There's a lot of people dependent on seafood. Mm -hmm. So look at what's going on. And there are some serious pollution problems that need addressing there. And then finally, and probably the most sensitive uh, of all is look at alternative protein. So I know it's a list, but a lot of them actually apply in other areas as well. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think what I'm hearing from that is um, <clears throat> we need to look at the system as a whole, yeah. take an, a holistic approach to it and see all of the interconnections and address them as one um, one kind of system rather than looking at them sort of piecemeal, I guess, which is, I think, what has happened so far. And it's not necessarily the best way of doing it. Um, so I think the last sort of set question, I guess, is for Lauren. Um, but if anybody else would like to provide thoughts and that, you know, you're obviously very welcome to jump in. Um, what would be your sort of takeaway messages um, for policymakers, for food and beverage companies, for other investors? I'm going to start. I'm going to start with. Is that on? I'm going to start with the food and beverage companies. We need um, you to set targets and metrics around um, increasing the percentage of healthy, define healthy properly, um, and guidance with regulators. I want to understand what the marketing spend is for healthy versus unhealthy. Um, so there's a couple of points there. Um, obviously, food waste is a, is a huge issue, and especially in the global south, or let's call it the global majority, which is what they define themselves as. Um, and this idea of like looking at, you know, how do you capture, how do you reduce food waste and, and also increase access to healthier food, right, along the, um, the, the food chain. Um, for regulators, um, I had something good there, but um, let me go to investors. Um, it is, oh, for regulators and for food, and actually for the multi-stakeholder approach. Food is global, but it's also very local. And one of the areas I wanted to bring up is commercial viability or lack of viability on micronutrients. And so we need to look at both overnutrition or obesity and undernutrition. And really, I think that takes a stakeholder, a multi-stakeholder approach. Investors, regulators, health ministries, um, and, and other regulators um, coming together to really think about how to innovate on things like micronutrient deficiencies. Um, and, and are there ways to commercialize it? Uh, because most of the companies I engage right now say there's no really commercial incentive to invest there. So we need to change the investment dynamics of micronutrients. Um, and then third, we'll talk about investors. Um, I think investors need to, one, prioritize health and nutrition on their, both from an investment and engagement and stewardship approach. They should join uh, groups like um, the Food Foundation and the in the engagement. Um, and and then and we need to come together and 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 engage um, for that fundamental change, but really transformative change in the in the ecosystem of food systems. Thank you. Yeah, and I think um, the the point about working together with with others. So, for instance, through the Investor Coalition on Food Policy, um, through the uh, Access to Nutrition Index um, initiative, and through Share Actions, also like um, it's called. Uh, long long-term investors in healthy people uh, people's health isn't it yeah. that's it yeah life um <laughs> another acronym um yeah i think those are all really important initiatives and if we can work together to sort of amplify each other's messages i think that would be really transformative um so that sort of brings us to the end of the kind of initial discussion uh, and we have about five ten minutes for any Q and A. Does anybody? Oh, yeah, I can see. Some, um, Lauren, sure. Yeah. If you could maybe just tell us uh, your name and which organisation you're from, that'd be great. Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Olivier from the Quebec Business Council on the Environment. It's a cross-sector organisation uh, in Quebec, in Canada. Um, sorry, this is a difficult question, but um, I was very interested in the discussion about disclosure, and especially uh, supply chain and value chain disclosure. 
Um, on the one side, on in, in different sectors, I've heard how useful that is. On the other hand, I was assisting um, a few weeks ago a consultation in Quebec on modernizing regulation for, for uh, agriculture. And some of the producers were talking about mental health issues, which has many factors, but one of which being regulatory burden and reporting requirements. And so how do we kind of balance both these issues? So, so who, I, I, who would like to take that one? I'll, 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 yeah, should, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, well, obviously, we don't want mental health issues uh, related to that, uh, clearly. Um, but there is some pretty good technology around to which people go, yes, there's a cost. And I don't want to take the cost. And now you get slightly trapped because you want the technology to help people's uh, uh, mental health. Interestingly, uh, if you actually start looking at the cost, we've actually done work because as soon as you say a cost, the CFO goes, yeah, you know, I mean, that's partly their job. Let's be fair. No, we don't want that. Unless it improves my margin. And we are seeing lots of examples of that. Now, you could say we're being selective, but we are seeing and it's surprising people. So let, let me give you a, a real example of this because they're, they're actually on the campus here. So the French retailer Carrefour. Uh, we did an analysis for them and uh, they actually shared with us where a lot of their products were coming from and the prices that they were paying. I'm, I'm not being critical of them at all. This was all published and all open. Well, they didn't realize because it's not the way the corporates looked at it. They found that their most sustainable products were actually their highest margin. So I, I think we've got to be slightly careful about going traceability is a cost. I, I get sometimes it can absolutely be a stress, but let me also take the other side. So there was some work done actually a few years ago now by IBM who were looking at traceability systems and they were testing it. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was with Walmart. And, and what they did, I thought was very clever. They'd put in a, a quite a sophisticated, um, I think it was called food chain if I remember at the time. And they had some, they've got worried about uh, the quality of some mangoes. It just happened to be mangoes. They use the technology and they had them off the shelves within about three hours. They identified where it came from, what the problem was, and they removed it and put another product. So actually there was a profitability side uh, on that as well. They also followed the paper system. Took them 12 days. OK, to get there. So I'm sort of wondering where the stress was, you know. Yeah. Oh, OK, the farmers themselves having to. Yeah, I don't know. And and, and maybe my colleagues have a view or maybe Sarah that's from the food founder. I don't know whether that's just becoming part of business. I, I'm. You might say, well, that still doesn't answer. I, I, I sort of. Maybe yes. So, right. yeah. Like, there's no young people doing that. No. Yeah. Much. yeah. The main problem is actually, and, and we map it, if you look at the profitability of the food system, and this won't surprise you, it's not the farmers. And you go, this, but this is madness. So uh, most of the profits sit with the food manufacturers and processors and the retailers. And if you're being really cynical about it, they want to keep the money there. They want to keep the profits there. And if the profits are there, people are more likely to lend to it because it's a safer lending. And the farmers are big. I completely get the stress with that. And I think that is the single biggest challenge. How do you reallocate that capital and keep the financial markets on site? And that does stress me because I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Incentive is so important here. Um, so I actually engaged um, a big yogurt maker in the U.S. on 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 actually some fundamental changes they were making to their their um, their sourcing practices of organic uh, uh, milk, um, and uh, totally dis um, totally moving away from small farmer holders to sort of bigger commercial. Um, and we were like so. What is, you know, we understand your incentive, but what about this idea of shared prosperity, right? And 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 really redefining that. So incentive is so critically important. Um, and uh and and frankly, the willingness um, you know, to pay more 
Um, but then also able, right, suppliers. So this idea of like building more sustainable uh, supply chains um, with enabling um, and capacity building of suppliers to raise their level of say reporting or, or, other, uh, or, or other manufacturing processes. Oh, um, yes, I mean, I, I think I totally agree with, with both of them. I think, you know, it is a very broken system, the, the food system from all angles and particularly from those sort of business models. You know, we have this huge concentration of big food um, manufacturers, which have pretty much had quite a monopoly, um, you know, and they have led to a lot of the, the destructions um, in terms of the environmental degradation and um, taking over large parts of, of the world for their supply base. So I think you have got this real problem with the, the, where the power lies within the food system and, and the food chain. And, and that is definitely something that, that needs to be addressed to make a more sort of sustainable model as well. Thank you. I think we've got time for maybe one quick question if, if anybody else has got anything. Oh. oh. Hi, um, I'm Alexis Ray from the Meridian Institute, and I'm curious um, about bringing along other investors who might not currently be interested in the food system or understand the degree of complexity of the food system that you all are talking about. And so pardon my ignorance, but I would assume that you all are very advanced in your thinking about health and nutrition and sustainability and equity, et cetera. And so I'm curious what your ideas are for bringing along other investors to ensure that their investments in the food system are contributing to the transformation that we seek. Sorry, I said it wasn't a quick one. Shall I? One quick thought. One quick thought, um, and that is, um, if you're a public pension fund and you've got, you know, you're a universal owner and you've got beneficiaries, you know, that you need to support going out 30, 50 years, think about, you know, the support for healthier food and nutrition and, you know, the causality, right? The direct linkages or in, or influence or whatever you want to call it, the connection between um, the health and well-being and the healthcare plans and morbidity rates um, that increase your costs, right? To support those, um, those, 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 uh, those um, beneficiaries. So yeah, causality between, uh, yeah. but yeah, yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it goes back in terms of, um, you know, what we're seeing in the investor market at the moment. Certainly, you know, Green Bank um, has been very much sort of pioneer in this, space uh you know over 20 years old looking at the sustainable investment side and you know one one of our roles is is to make sure that we're meeting our clients requirements for um, investing in a more sustainable way but there's also you know key financial risks and key financial opportunities in terms of the sustainability market um as well in terms of um, looking at investments with that lens of sustainability and I think, it, I mean, it's a really changing landscape now where we have enormous amount of regulation coming in. So either within the EU with the S SFDR um, or um, in in the uh, in UK at the moment, we've got the FCA that's just brought in um, SDR, more, more acronyms, the uh, Sustainable Disclosure um, Requirements. So it's not really a case that investors can ignore this now because the landscape is really changing um, from the regulatory side. So I think, you know, we do find a lot of investment management houses, they're not set up at the moment. Um, you know, certainly we've had a, 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 a very well um, resourced research team that are looking at all these issues, recognizing this sort of financial materiality and recognizing why you do need to view um, investments with that sustainability um, lens because of the financial um, materiality. So I think more are coming to, to the, the game in terms of recognizing why they need to do this. But because the landscape is, 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 is changing, um, I think it is easier to draw investors in they realize they do need to understand that that broader landscape of what's impacting stocks valuations now 
I you. guess the obvious answer is education, which is really unhelpful, isn't it? Um, and that it's sort of unhelpful because uh, we've been sort of involved in a, a few debates because you say, well, the obvious way to educate is labelling. And then everyone wants their labelling and then it becomes so complex on the label. No one understands it. So no one knows what dolphin friendly means anymore. It's really difficult. But actually, I'm quite optimistic. And the reason I'm optimistic is because of, it's going to sound strange, is because of greenwashing. And the reason I say that is because I think regulators across the world are on this. And I think they believe this is one of the biggest paydays they're ever going to have. And you're seeing it from a financial viewpoint, but also really important to consumer viewpoint. And maybe in terms of food, that's even more important. In most cases, you don't need more legislation. It's already there under consumer law. And I really mean it's global. This is not just global north. It's happening everywhere. And I think that will really get, if I may just pick on food firms, to think, what, what do I mean by this is healthy? And if you take almost, we've looked extensively, if you look at almost all the regulation, never makes you popular with lawyers because they'll go, there's nuances. I get that. But there's a very simple rule that they're all putting in place or implying. If you say something, can you justify it? So I don't know why this shouldn't apply to healthy food. So Food Foundation is going to sort it out for us. <laughs> Thank you, John. That's, that's a, quite a challenge set for us, but we'll take it on. Um, I think we need to wrap up, right, Juliet? Yeah, okay. So, sorry, no more time for questions, but thank you for your contributions. They were really, really interesting. Um, I think what we've heard is that, you know, the regulatory landscape is changing. That should indeed be transformative. And um, if it were mandatory, that would be fantastic because it would level the playing field for, for companies and really help to shift, um, you know, the, the the system in which the businesses are operating. And, and hopefully that would translate into a shift in, in food culture. Um, so, yeah, these, you know, obviously the governments are responsible for uh, changing the, the regulation, the, the uh, parameters and, and setting incentives. Um, and until we see that, you know, uh, it'll be much harder to uh, to actually get that systemic transformational change. Um, but, you know, it is sort of hopefully happening. Um, but we do also need to be aware of the kind of corporate lobbying that that is also taking place. And that needs sort of much more transparency. Um, yeah. And then we've also heard about how we need to sort of reallocate the capital to be much more equitable across the whole the whole value chain and create kind of shared prosperity and enable suppliers and and uh, you know create those incentives so um yeah that was also a really important point i think um i think we probably need to wrap up because we're running really short on time so thank you very much for joining us and thank you particularly to our our panelists for your insights and your expertise during this discussion um thank you very much and i hope you have a very successful cop for the remainder of the conference and um yeah have a good day everybody Thank you.